Hi, Darren. Hey, how are you? Good, thanks. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. Morning, everyone. So, it's uh, looking like a nice day outside for once now. It's uh, been a few days of really, really bad weather, at least in my area. So, it's nice to see a bit of sun again. Well, what is your area? I live in Mitcham, so okay. uh, near, near Croydon. Yeah, so actually, actually, we're very close. So, we'll, we'll have shared the same weather patterns. <laughs> where, where, where are you? I'm uh, uh, just down the road, well, up the road in Streatham. Oh, are you? Okay. Nice. Yeah. How are you? Are you? I'm just outside Newbury, so I've got a very short cycle ride trek into the head office um, in Thatcham, just four miles away from Newbury HQ. Yeah, your um, your HQ is incredible. Like every time I go to that HQ, I'm so impressed by it. The uh, little river that goes outside and uh, it's, it's, it's quite of... it's quite daunting the first time you kind of you go along to it. I remember you know my interview process there, and I kind of pitched up, and you, you've got your own buses that take you from the railway station to HQ and uh, it was at I think it's like 4.30 um, on an afternoon once and I was the only person on the bus as well because um, obviously nobody's going in at that point yeah. and then you're kind of you're hit with the, the enormity of what Vodafone has there and, and as you say it's, it's absolutely beautiful as well. It's, it's such a good campus like unbelievable campus for anyone that hasn't been there before. Um, I when I, The first time I went there I parked in the in the staff area and then got a, a telling off by your security guards. Like you're not supposed to be here, um, <laughs> but it's uh, yeah, it's an incredible campus. Um, I love uh, coming into the London office as well. This London the location, cool now. yeah, close to Borough Market. It's yeah, it's fantastic as well. Yeah, you've uh, you've chosen some good locations to your offices. That's for sure. Should we give um should we give everyone one more minute just to get in? So we'll start at three minutes past just for anyone that hasn't joined yet. <clears throat> So for, for any of the listeners today, just so you know what we're going through, it's obviously on the title, but we're going through practice to production. Um, so. I think we, it's gone three minutes past my time. So let's start. So uh, I'll let you guys do the introduction and then I, I can talk about myself. Yeah. Um, hello, everybody. Uh, very good to, to have you here. Um, uh, yeah, you can see, see who I am on the slide um, and you can see what I do from that slide as well. Head of Product Engineering at Vodafone UK. It might not be entirely obvious um, what that actually means. Um, so with regards to my remit, um, I have got uh, the Backend Engineering Guild uh, reporting to myself, our business analysis guild, um, our agile guild, and our release team. Uh, so they all report into me, and yeah, we look after our digital estate. And so um, within that digital estate, we've got all of our websites, we've got uh, we've got our mobile applications, um, and really, it's yeah, you know, it's the online interaction uh, space that um, Vodafone has between Vodafone and our customers. Uh, over to you, Carl. Hi everyone, so Carl Woodrow. So I'm currently platform engineering manager reporting to Dave um, on the digital team. Um, my history has, has perhaps been a little a little different. I spent than you'd expect for Vodafone because I spent 20 years in enterprise software to start with. Um, but most interestingly out of that, I think before moving to Vodafone, I was the head of an engineering team delivering a new SaaS solution running on AWS um, and being responsible for er all areas of delivery. So um, build through to operations and, and really owning that platform. Um, I moved to Vodafone in 2018 uh, as technical lead for the UK big data team. Um, interesting as sort of switch there. Um, and I led the team in designing and delivering a new AWS based analytics platform. Um, and that included data pipelines, machine learning pipelines. So, so not a, a lot of new learning for myself there. Um, interesting role for me to take for that was because data really is driving all decisions now across businesses including Vodafone um, and it was an area that I wanted to get into and understand more um, and having moved into the digital team as well I can see data is a real important part of of how we work and, and drive decisions um, so I was 18 months in that role having lunch with a friend one day uh, in the Newbury campus uh, who works as a scrum lead in the digital team and, and just as we were getting up to sort of head back to work, he said to me, 
hey, I've got a role that, or there's a role in the engineering team that would suit you that you might be interested in. Um, so having had a look at it, it was, it was kind of a no-brainer for me. Um, it was the area, it was back into software engineering. Um, I've been sat in the all hands, IT all hands, watching the cool stuff that d digital have been delivering over the, that first 18 months that I was with, with the team. Um, got the opportunity to chat to Dave in London um, and the passion and direction that the team was taking was exactly where I wanted to be for my next role. Um, so here I am, luckily landed in that role now, uh, really enjoying it. Um, moved into the role in May during the height of lockdown, um, but we're gonna talk more on that later. So I'm um, gonna hand back over to Dave now to talk us where we've come from as a team. Thanks, Carl. Um, Darren, did you want to do a short introduction? Well, you, you guys have done such a good introduction to yourself. I, I feel like mine's going to be really boring now. Um, so, like, uh, so I'm Darren. I'm the lead account manager here at Hacker Job. Uh, I've had the privilege over the last three years of working with uh, Vodafone, both in London and Newbury. So, as we talked about at the start, I've had the opportunity to go to the uh, to the offices. I'm sure when we get to life at Vodafone, we'll, we'll talk a little bit more about that. But I'll leave my introduction nice and short so that we can uh, move on to the topics. Great. Thanks. So um, yeah, you can see you can see there we've gone through our introductions. What we're going to to run through today, a um, uh, bit about the journey that we've been on, uh, particularly I guess from uh, my perspective um, and from Carl's, and how things have changed during the times that we have been um, with digital engineering. Uh, we're going to talk about some of the key things. Um, that we believe have helped facilitate that change. Um, and we're also going to talk about you know, what's next on the horizon um, that we're expecting to accomplish to achieve even greater amounts of change. Um, and then finally, we'll, we'll cap it off uh, with, um, as Carl alluded to, uh, some of our thoughts around you know, what life was at if you were working as an engineer or in any other roles, what life was at BC, so before COVID, um, what, how that changed, um, from April onwards, and uh, what we expect the future to look like. Uh, just so everyone's aware, we, uh, as at the bottom of what we'll cover, there is a Q&A section. We're going to leave questions and answers to the end, just because having looked at how this, uh, this presentation flows. So get your questions in, and during that last 20 minutes or so, we'll make sure that we answer all your questions. Cool. So um, in terms of how long I've been at Vodafone, uh, I have just come up to my one year anniversary. Um, so it was this time last year that uh, I entered the fray. Um, I, I distinctly remember chatting to Ben Connolly, who's the head of digital engineering as part of my yeah, interview process and realizing that yeah, we, are, we are here in digital as part of a much wider organization. That organization is undergoing a lot of change. And what I was particularly impressed with was um, the passion by which um, he wanted to, uh, to change the organization. And it wasn't just digital that he was looking to change. He was looking to, to actually change Vodafone UK as an opco, the way we deliver software, um, uh, and really change the company from uh, a telecoms company, a telco, to uh, an actual techco. And, for me, that was something that was really attractive. It was clearly going to be challenging. Uh, my previous roles had been in uh, large organizations where we had been trying to undergo um, the, this series of change. It's also been in small startups as well, where actually um, you don't necessarily have some of the, uh, the challenges associated with, uh, with, with changes you may do in larger organizations. And so for me, I think because we had um, we had that actual driving force of wanting to deliver software in a better manner, using modern engineering practices and actually trying to, to change what is essentially a huge company. That was what was really attractive for me. And it, it, it was gonna to be tough and it, it's not been easy, but I personally think, and I hope to illustrate this over the next um, 40 or so minutes, I personally think that even in you know, the, the last 12 months, let alone you know, the two or three years before that, there has been some absolutely huge steps made with digital leading the way. And so if I look back to one year ago, stepping into, in, into my role, um, uh, I, 
very much remember my first six weeks as being one of the most difficult and challenging six weeks um, of starting any company. Uh, we had just delivered a project called Lionheart. You'll know in large companies that you have lots of secret, top secret code names uh, for large scale projects, but this was something that the development teams had spent all summer and before that getting ready for. Um, uh, the actual proposition itself seems relatively simple. It was a way of bringing home broadband and your mobile plans together and offering, um, offering great value to the customer. And so for the first two weeks, kind of joined the team, got to know a few people, but I spent the majority of my time in war rooms. And <laughs> for me, and I don't know how many people, some of you will know what being in a war room is like, others of you will not. Um, uh, they are not the most pleasant of, uh, of rooms to be in, particularly on a 24 by seven basis. And yeah, we were very much trying to get this Lionheart proposition out. Um, we had lots and lots of issues. It was very difficult to get those issues resolved. Um, a lot of teams would take an issue, they'd analyze it, and then they'd kind of say, hey, this is not to do with us. This is, this is another team's issue. And that issue would pass on to the other team. And so uh, the Lion Heart proposition went out. It was great. And then from there, we went straight into the next big proposition, which was a brand new mobile application that we were delivering, what we call MVA 10, my Vodafone app, version 10. And we went through the same process. It's literally stuck in war rooms, people uh, reacting to fires that were cropping up all, all over the place. And we were just doing our damnedest to get, uh, to get all of the different services into a stable state so that we could get this proposition out. And then uh, that proposition would go out. And we then had another third big proposition. It was what we called Zeus at the time. Uh, but this was our iPhone launch. And you know, typically, uh, iPhone and Samsung are some of the biggest launches for us as uh, as a, as a phone company. Um, and I, I'd seen how active uh, my, my boss, Ben, had been during these last two uh, large scale proposition deliveries. And I, I really wanted, you know, he shouldn't, he shouldn't be in the war rooms. He shouldn't be the person kind of um, driving resolution or helping to drive. Um, so I, I remember saying to him at the time, Ben, you step back from Zeus, leave it, leave it to me, I'll take care of it. Um, uh, and yeah, I'll, I'll be that person to just provide the continuous updates to him. And uh, so that was, well, I don't necessarily regret that, but it was, it was good kind of getting into the deep end of things and just realizing how painful that whole process was. And it, it almost felt like it was, it was incessant, it was nonstop. Anyhow, we did get Zeus, the, the project out. We, we had a successful iPhone launch last year. Um, but really, it, it was just a question of going from war room to war room to war room. And look, I think from our perspective, um, you know, we, uh, we almost wore the scars. Our culture was almost wearing the scars of each of those battles with pride. And it was kind of like, ah, oh, you know, we, we even called, you know, our devs who worked the weekends, you know, they, you know we, we celebrated that almost in a sense because it was you know we were calling everyone weekend warriors these are our great weekend warriors but we want to wanted to really move away from that that wasn't the kind of culture that we wanted to create and for a lot of people you know when you have large scale proposition delivery after after in, incessantly one after another it it does wear out thin pretty quickly now it's all very well for me coming in fresh to say, hey, yeah, this was the state of affairs and it was pretty challenging. Actually, and, and, and it doesn't sound like a great picture, but it's important to always remember the journey up until that point. And if you look back to two years, to three years before that, um, where we've come from, even up to that point, it had there had been huge amount of change just to get us there. And yeah, as I've mentioned, you know, traditionally, Vodafone has been a telco company, so really focused on the network. IT has historically been outsourced and delivered by partners. Um, 
And, you know, typically in that scenario, you'd have a small number of Vodafone people who'd be there helping manage delivery, helping ensure that the projects were uh, delivered um, to, to the specifications that we had asked for. Um, but we really wanted to change that. And so in the years prior to that, the digital team had gone from something that was very small, I think maybe around eight to 10 people to 150 people. Not only that, they had developed the new services in a new uh, architectural style, the microservices architectural pattern. Um, uh, and, you know, they really, the, the department had really led the way in transitioning from that, uh, that outsourced um, way of delivering software to a much more agile, internally focused um, uh, way of delivering software. And, you know, the, the whole ethos was, you know, we wanted to develop, develop things for ourselves. We wanted to build those capabilities ourselves. We wanted to have things that were built with latest technologies, um, great standards, and we wanted to attract great talent. Um, and we wanted to build up that team with the best people and we wanted to nurture them and you know, wanted to ensure that we did everything we could to make it an exciting place that people would want to stay. And so really up until that point that I came in, you know, this whole journey, which in itself would have been incredibly challenging, had, had taken, uh, taken part. And so it's really important to kind of reflect on where you've come from um, uh, rather than just, you know, saying, hey, this is, this is, this is not great. Um, so there had been huge amounts of progress already. And um, for me, even though, you know, there had been this progress, it felt like we were in an incredibly, incredibly reactive state. You know, we had fires cropping up uh, left, right and center. And I think one of the things that was maybe a contributing cause to all of this was the way that we delivered software. And you can see on the right there, there's you know, a very basic infographic. We, we use blue green flips to deploy our software. Um, uh, we would have you know, our blue services, let's say they, they were active and you know, customer requests were flowing through all of our blue, blue services. Um, uh, and any updates we made, we made to our green service estate and we'd get that stable. And you know, we'd, we'd know um, uh, that we weren't gonna have too many issues or any issues for our customers. And we would you know, flip all of our traffic over to, to green. And this worked pretty well for us to begin with, right? It, um, uh, it ensured that we could have confidence in our releases. It ensured that we could have zero downtime. So we didn't have to put up holding pages yeah, that was quite a big step forwards for us where typically you know, each release would um, entail maybe half an hour, an hour's worth of downtime. Um, uh, and your yeah, rollback, if we had issues, that was really easy as well. We could just flip back from green back to blue. Um, so there are lots of advantages of the flip. We call it the flip. Um, but what we found was that as we developed more and more microservices, it actually wasn't a particularly scalable solution for us. Um, uh, and so it got to the point when, when I, you know, maybe a year ago, when we had 50 plus microservices and each of those releases that we made would have 75, 80 plus changes to maybe 20 or 30 of those microservices. And so to actually, get that particular release stable, it would take longer than our actual release cycle that we had planned out. And so in plan, um, our idea was to, to flip every single sprint. So we'd split uh, our sprints are on a two week cadence. So we'd flip uh, twice a month. And um, it got to the point where it was so difficult to actually make, uh, make each one of those releases stable that would start skipping out on releases. So then it would uh, you know, go back to a one month cadence. Um, one of the things that uh, we were doing then as well incorrectly um, was we were counting each of our deployments to the inactive 
uh, services. So let's say Blue was active for our customers. Every single one of our deployments to the green services was counted as a, an actual release. Whereas, um, and, and we'll kind of go on to this, actually those releases weren't directly impacting our customers. And so in reality, you know, if, we, if we're actually really honest with ourselves, we, we had kind of one release, maybe two releases each month. Um, there was, I guess, another wrong behavior that the flips drove. And, and, and maybe this wasn't part of the, the actual flip itself. Maybe it was our implementation or our process by which we, um, by which we use these flips. And, and that behavior was that uh, from a development and an engineering team perspective, you would get given your requirements for each sprint. You'd go ahead and you would um, you, you'd code it out uh, to the best of your ability. It would get peer reviewed. Um, and then the way we regression test and integration test and, and, and really um, you know, fully test our software, that's, that's handled in a, a separate team. So that's not handled within the engineering team itself. So that's handled by a SIT team. And then uh, we also have a performance testing team, our PAT team. And then uh, from there, actually, our release team would be responsible for shipping that software. And then you know, once it's in production, we would have a completely different team taking care of any issues that were found in production. And so what this meant with the, in combination with the flip was that a development team would work on feature A in sprint one, and they would develop it. And then uh, in sprint two, they would work on feature B. And at that point, feature A in sprint two is undergoing SIT testing, and it's undergoing performance testing. It's not yet out in production. And so what that meant was when issues and defects did arise during those periods of testing and performance testing, um, actually to context switch, for those teams to context switch, back to um, actually resolving those issues that obviously had an overhead. And by the time we actually released that particular feature, they were maybe onto their third sprint. And so when the feature was actually released to our customers, our development teams had moved so far on that actually to, to get, you know, to have the pride and to celebrate the fact that you actually got something released to the customer we, we didn't necessarily have as much of that as we'd have liked because our development teams had moved on so far. And so um, for me, this was, yeah, this was one of the things that uh, we wanted to target first. Um, and so this flip we found wasn't scalable. Um, uh, we felt like the teams weren't really engaging with business propositions as they should have been because actually you know, they developed something and they wouldn't see it in the hands of the customer. Um, and so if we look at back at one year ago, that was the state that we were in. And so what has changed since then? So if we move on to the next slide, um, the, the thing that we've tried to do is really shift the culture even further. I mean, there's, there'd been a huge amount of culture shift and behavioral change up to that point, but we wanted to, to really focus on this. And we wanted to try and give each of our development teams more ownership and more autonomy, whilst also trying to ensure that, you know, there was alignment between overarching goals and objectives. We couldn't have everybody just going off on their own, doing different things, otherwise we wouldn't have got anything done. Um, and so in order to effectively scale, and, you know, we have scaled a lot in the last year as well, um, we recognize the need to create truly autonomous development teams that were empowered and that had much greater ownership of their services. That kind of cultural shift is not easy. It doesn't happen overnight and we've still got massive amount of progress to make on that, but we have made progress. And the two things that we identified um, to kind of kickstart us with this was tackling uh, two of those problems. Um, well, one of the problems that I've just talked about, so the way we release, and also the organizational structure of our teams. And so, you know, as I've described, um, uh, we had our, had our big, big flips, and that was really the only way that we released. Um, uh, and and it, it, it was becoming a bit of a vicious cycle. It felt like it was really difficult to break out of. You go from one release and then you'd immediately have to start on your next flip. So I 
think we we tackled it in for me what was a pretty simple manner we operate um, using our own version of safe that we feel is is works for us at this current point in time um, but we started one of our program increments as we always do with a kickoff and during that kickoff we set an objective to the teams it was a very clear objective and wasn't open to ambiguity but was also not prescriptive so the way the teams would go about achieving this objective was up to them um, uh, and the objective was we want every single team to release once outside of a flip release in this three-month period by yourselves and there's no reason particularly why we couldn't have done that already um, uh, so how you do that it's up to you as a team all you've got to do in three months is release a bit of software outside of these large microlithic flip releases um, uh, and we were very clear to say to the teams that you know some of you will achieve this and others of you won't so some you'll absolutely smash this and some did and others you know you're not you're not actually going to be able to achieve it because of i don't know data difficulties or testing difficulties, whatever it might be. The important thing to do is to try it out. And the important thing to uncover is what is preventing you from doing it so that we can actually start to make progress on the things that are preventing us from achieving ultimately what we wanted to do. So during that time, during that PI, that program increment, we didn't push the teams too much on it. We kind of, we reiterated the message from time to time. And what we did do is whenever a team did successfully release independently, you know, we really, really shouted about it. We really celebrated each and every single independent release. And it wasn't that many to begin with. Um, uh, we created a dedicated Slack channel. Uh, in terms of you know, the celebration, it, it ranged from you know, basic messages to literally messages on Slack with more emojis than I ever knew existed. I think there were like four or five lines of emojis. And it was, what, what that drove was, um, it was great to see more and more people getting excited about just, you know, the ability to release independently. Um, and so I, I feel that what it did is that it actually encouraged teams who maybe weren't as engaged with that particular objective to become more engaged. Um, we also reset the way that we counted our releases. So uh, it was pretty drastic, but we went from, I don't know, 120, 130, where we were, yeah, you know, we said we were releasing, but it wasn't an actual release that affected our customer. We reset that data to actually be data to show a release that would impact each and every one of our customers. And so that kind of went from up here down to what was something that was re realistic and what we felt was reflective of what a release actually meant. Um, uh, and so from that point, we, we had an assessment after that first program increment, and we then set the teams a second objective in the next program increment. So uh, we iterated on the objective and the iteration was then, okay, so you may have had one kind of SME in the team who is you know, really driving the independent releases. What we wanted then, uh, to do was to ensure that everybody had exposure and experience to releasing independently and so the objective was that um, every single person in your team must drive one independent release at least once this spring and again you know some teams absolutely smashed that other teams maybe did their first independent releases during that program increment um, we're at the point now where flips are very much a thing of the past. The last flip that we actually did was on the 20th of April. Um, and since then, every single thing that we have developed has gone out independently. One of the things that we used to do, which you know, we, we used to classify independent releases, and, and a lot of the teams who adopted this first uh, were teams who maybe had low risk changes. So, I don't know, markup updates or styling updates to get out and those were the first teams to do it but right now we're in a position where we're utilizing a lot of other tooling to help us with it but every single team and every single feature is going out uh, on a team by team basis which is is really really cool um, uh, and 
we are at this point where we've gone from, I think it was maybe five to 10 independent releases each month. Now we're at 130 um, consistently uh, over the last three to four months. And the mindset has completely changed. I think, you know, if you were to ask anybody, how, how would you actually release software instead of going, oh, well, you know, we just kind of, we submit our pull request and then we forget about it now. Actually, the mindset is, well, no, we, we, we are wanting to move our definition of done to production. We are wanting to actually ensure um, that a piece of work isn't completed until we ourselves have got that into production. So the mindset shift has, I think it has happened now. We've got other mind sh mindset shifts to make, but that particular one has happened and people know that in order to get a piece of software out, it's that, that responsibility lies within the team. The other area that we've looked at is the way we've organized our teams. And so one of the things we've done is we've created what we call feature teams. So the way we were very much set up before was we had our backend engineering squads and our front end engineering squads um, all sitting within their own teams. And regardless of you know, whether they were building entity services or whether they were building what we call journey composition services, those teams kind of, they didn't operate in isolation, but they had their own backlogs and they, they kind of operated independently of other teams, though were very much aware of any cross dependencies that they had to deliver any project. So one of the things that we've changed is for teams that make sense, for teams that are delivering vertical slices of features, um, we have merged those two teams together so that those teams have got the full capability to deliver any one particular feature. And I think you know, for us, that in combination with the way releases are now managed has given teams a far greater sense of ownership um, in, in the services that a team is responsible for. So if we move on to the, the next slide. Um, so for us, that ownership now, you know, we, we, we develop code and the team now knows that you know, they uh, will release it. We're going to start moving our objectives on to tackle other areas which we know are important. And so some of those areas uh, are highlighted here. Um, we're really focusing on quality right now. It's it's a big, big driver. We've got, uh, you know, as Carl alluded, um, we make sure that all of our decisions are data-driven decisions. And we have huge amounts of data um, uh, showcasing the current levels of quality for us. And we've got lots of different ways that we measure this, whether it's, you know, uh, whether it's the number of defects associated with any piece of work, uh, the amount of defects that are found within team or external to the team, uh, production defects, um, whether it's the actual cycle time, the amount of throughput that we have, um, uh, lots and lots of data to, to help us with our decisions. And for now, as we have done previously, we're setting um, a simple uh, and very clear objective that's going to tackle part of uh, these next challenges that we want to over overcome. And so we are uh, setting teams uh, the objective to um, ensure that the majority of defects that are found are found within team. And by that, we kind of mean before a team kind of hands their work over to our SIT team for integration and regression testing, Actually, we want the majority, the largest percentage of defects to be found before a team hands that piece of work over. And there are some things that we're doing to help out with that. Um, you know, we also want to be to become more predictable as we uh, as we develop our software and, and we have other OKRs around that. Um, but really, we want to get to a place whereby a team feels like they've got full ownership and empowerment of the software delivery lifecycle for them. And so, um, uh, you know, the, whilst, whilst the team can focus on developing and getting their software out, we're also putting a lot of emphasis on how your software behaves for a customer once it's in production. And how do you know that it's actually behaving the way you want it to? And so for that, you know, we've started embedding um, again, some first steps towards uh, alerting for teams using PagerDuty. And so now during um, office hours, you know, 
teams teams are alerted immediately if certain error thresholds go over a certain rate. Um, and yeah, the way we tackle that, because you can imagine for a team that's that's not something that's familiar to them, it can be a disruption, right? It could you, you can expect pushback on it. Um, but we approached it. Uh, we split all of our teams out into little sections and we were very clear on the boundaries by which call out was supposed to be on and we ran fire drills from time to time as well so we kind of uh we'd, we'd give teams warning in advance uh that fire drills were going to happen and all they had to do was you know send a very quick response and it got to the stage where we had all of our teams on board and all of them answering um fire drill calls within our uh very short sla for that um we're also focusing going forwards on uh, ensuring that development teams are using um, observability tools such as Datadog, APM, um, uh, such as, uh, well, we, we're using Datadog for logging as well, but uh, AWS also offers um, a, a lot of insight into the way our services are running for our customers. And so we're, we're very much encouraging teams um, to ensure that they know uh, how many requests are coming in for their service on a day-to-day -day basis or how many errors standard for their, their services if they even do have errors. Um, so these are things that we're pushing and driving. Um, and so this leads us into what's next. What, what is kind of next on our horizon um, for our teams? And one of the things that I spoke about then was giving teams the capability to take more control of um, the software delivery life, delivery life cycle. And so the next step, uh, the next big thing that we're doing is focusing on automation engineering. And you know, for this, we want to improve the quality of testing on our lower environments. Um, we want to reduce the number of defects that we find with SIT down to zero. Um, we want to have this shift left mentality where we're testing earlier and we're finding issues um, earlier on in, in the, in the uh, SDLC. And yeah, we want that testing to be automated and to be continuous. And we feel that this will um, have some really great outputs in terms of you know, the metrics that we're tracking. Um, uh, we feel that we'll have more releases to production. We think that the uh, cycle time by which we deliver software um, will improve. We think that our throughput will increase as well. And ultimately we think that, you know, the quality of what we're delivering is just, it's not only gonna be better for us because, you know, we may be called out less, but it's gonna be better for our customers. And that's really what's driving this. And alongside this, there's going to be a big focus on CI CD this year. Uh, and I'm going to hand over to Carl to talk a bit more about that. Thanks, Steve. Um, so, yeah, so now we're going to look at where we're heading with our, our CI CD pipelines. And what I want to say is we do have pipelines in place today, but it's not as automated as we'd like. And there is definitely manual testing involved in there to, to get us into production. Um, so we realize we have a lot more to do to get us to a true continuous integration, continuous delivery aspect. Um, but today, for example, we're releasing to multiple environments and different code branches to different environments to test different propositions. Um, and then as part of that, and then to get to production, you also need to raise to an environment where the systems and test team um, do their manual testing before given the green light, before we can do that independent release that Dave mentioned to, to get us into production. Um, so what we really want to get to is an automated pipeline that takes the existing kind of build and release to like dev that we have and automate that all the way through into production. Um, so as Dave alluded to, a lot of that is focusing around testing um, and automation testing and um, supplementing the test frameworks and the tools that the manual test team have, but bringing them into this automated pipeline as well. Um, so today that very sort of first automated acceptance testing phase where we're doing unit tests already we have behavioral driven tests so if anyone's familiar with bdd um, a lot of the teams have driven towards that in both the front end and back end so we already have some automation tooling around testing um, specifically more around our apis and um, some of our 
our micro sites for, for the front end. Um, and we also have software quality gates at the moment as well, controlled by SonarCube. Um, and these are all build breakers. Any failures in these today break the build, as you would suggest, before it, before it can move forward um, and release. But what we're doing is we're looking at extending that testing in this phase as well. Um, fast feedback to developers that's going to stop us further down the line so that we can fix much sooner. I think hopefully everyone on the call knows that the sooner you find a defect, the cheaper it is to fix, um, not just from time, but actual from a sort of cost perspective, context switching, the money that you spend um, fixing it as well. So we, we already have, like I say, unit tests, API tests, co-quality gates. Um, we're looking to extend that to contract testing as well. Um, so this is stubbed environments that allow us to validate quickly whether we've broken anything with our integration paths that, and those downstream systems that we talk to and rely on. So be that like Siebel ordering systems, um, be that the integration layer that we talk to, which is called Till, um, and the interactions we have with them. We want to find out very fast what failures we have there. Um, and security tests as well. So whilst we do have SonarCube that's doing sort of code security and validation, we want to extend that to vulnerability testing. So are we introduced in libraries that have known vulnerabilities? Do our containers that we've built have known vulnerabilities within how they're configured? So really having um, security as the forefront of a thought process and not something that is currently sort of um, a manual process driven periodically at the side of that. And Whilst there may be some pain there, as as um, and I've been through this process before with Black Duck and and tooling like that, then you feel the pain as a developer when um, you introduce some code and a new vulnerability is found or or something has changed within one of the, the modules that you're using to to block you. But it's the right thing to do um, to to ensure that security is up there at the front. And then as we start moving into the right, we have the integration testing environments, which we have today, which is where a lot of our manual testing happens. Um, but this is where we really want that integration testing to be automated and to start um, really, really bearing us fruit to take us on to that um, to, to production. So whilst we have the ability tests, so we'll have usability, func uh, we'll have the functionality in there, um, reliability, as well um, it's also an environment where we can do things like pen tests um, so another layer of security testing if we're introducing a new service or a new integration that needs a penetration test before we're allowed to release it to production if we can automate that tool in it saves us time um, reduces the cost and complexity and it speeds our way through for sort of new demand and propositions into production as well. So that's a real release driver, some of those tests in that area to get us where we want to be. Um, so, so we then have an isolated um, sort of stage and environment where we can do performance and load testing. Um, this is something that we're really driving forward with now as infrastructure as code. So this environment can be spun up and down as can the others as and when needed. So you don't want your performance environment that's sat there like production, so production size, production scaling, costing you money 24-7. Um, it, it, it's there when you need it. So the pipeline will bring the environment up, perform the performance testing, perform the various load testing across services, and then obviously um, complete the report and then um, have an, a path where it's destroyed at the end as well. Obviously, with all all logs and evidence needed to to, to validate tests. Um, and whilst we're not quite mature enough for this yet, our goal is to get to chaos testing as well. We know we have certain services that are going to cascade errors um, and cause system outages should they break. But as we introduce new patterns such as circuit breakers um, into our services services, look how we can handle graceful degradation of performance um, and how we start, like Dave said, modern practices, not just around um, our tooling and CICD, but also within our code and design patterns as well. How we can then use the chaos testing to, to validate those in the system, um, tied into observability that Dave mentioned as well. So with chaos testing, 
if you take a service out, are the right alerts being triggered to the right people and, and, that, and that sort of thing. Um, and I think one of the key things is to allow us to achieve this is the way that we build and release code as well. So currently some of the teams use feature flags. We have feature flags in the UI. We have feature flags in backend services, but we, we don't have a single tool that handles that for us. So hopefully most of you are aware of what feature flags are and what they offer, but it allows us to hide code, um, API changes, or UI based on a setting, kind of kind of like an if statement really. That's if we get to the gist of, of, of what they kind of are, if you want to look at it that way. Um, but we'll be looking at using tooling to support this workflow such that we can release software that isn't ready to be exposed to production, but means we don't have long running branches that cause us merge nightmares and delays when that proposition is ready to be released to find out that you've got conflicts that you need to resolve. So we really want to start instilling the fact that teams should be using feature flags for pretty much all of the things that are new demand that aren't ready to be released, but we, but that, that master branch has got bug fixes in that need to get to production. Um, so we'll be looking at tooling to support that, that in the future also helps us to extend to a B testing and experimentation too. Um, so therefore we can really drive um, the knowledge of how people are using our sites, what works well for them and um, get that great insight coming back straight to the development teams. Um, so then obviously as we move into the actual release, um, as Dave said, we, we, we've still got our blue green environments. We're still, we're not doing flip environment, big flip releases but we're still running two sets of services. So we have the blue set and we, we have the green set of services that are still running. Um, we deploy to one in our independent releases, um, which is then live. And then we also have to obviously keep the stack up to date in the green environment should, should we need to do that flip release. So we're trying to move away with that from that and, and move towards Canary releases. So, so those I'm familiar with the Canary release it, it comes from that sort of that whole aspect of taking taking a canary down the mine to determine early early issues or or problems uh, with the air quality. And what you're doing here is you're releasing your service. And if I don't know if we've got ten containers running for a service, you might be pushing uh, a single container into that stack and then rolling a percentage of the traffic through it. So we can then use our observability tools and patterns to understand. Um, what the error rates are through that service, what the success rates are, and then slowly on success, you can increase the traffic and the deployment of, of that new release until you're 100% and the release is successful. Obviously, should you break any of those thresholds through quality and, and errors, then you've got that automatic failback where we can roll back the service, stop that, stop that um, canary deployment, and reinstate um, the old version. And that's something key as, as you see across that picture, um, where we fail, we want automatic rollback and feedback to the development team um, so they can resolve and, and fix, fix the issues. Um, key to that, once we get into production, Dave mentioned teams are responsible for how service uptime and availability during office hours at the moment. Um, and we have the SRE team, the systems um, reliant, reliant a reliability engineering team to help with that. Um, but key to that is the observability tools. Dave mentioned Datadog for login. Um, we're also moving to that for application performance management too. And this gives us um, a great insight into application performance. So it goes, if, if people haven't used an APM tool before, you get a, a full level of insight through, um, through your REST endpoint, for example, all the way down through the code stack through the interactions that it's having with downstream systems, the interactions it's having with your, your MySQL database or your RDS instance. Um, and then it visualizes that for you so that you can slice and dice through, through your application to find out your bottlenecks, to find out your service interactions. Um, and it also helps us build that sort of service interaction map as well. So we can see how we're consuming our services. As you, as you start to grow, the number of microservices across across your estate, that traceability and, and visibility into, interact, into your interactions 
gets harder and harder to do. Um, so using a tool such as an APM um, really aids that and will help will help the development teams understand how they behave under normal load, how we behave under heavy load, such as like the iPhone launch, um, and it will that will then feed back into our performance testing and the characteristics that we want to build um, as we go through that. Um, so our goal is to remove that manual approval. So we can see that nice big red cross now through our manual approval step for releasing. Um, so that's our end state is to, to build the confidence through the pipeline, through the tests and the automation that we've introduced so that we can go all the way through to production, use the Canary release, releases to, to test and validate um, before going for full success. Um, so that's kind of a whistle stop tour of where we want to get to. Um, so still lots of things to do on that journey. Lots of good things we have in place um, and engineers really engaged to, to get to this because we do want to release faster with, with more confidence. Um, so with that, um, we're going to now sort of switch tracks. I'm going to hand back to Dave and we're going to discuss um, life at Vodafone. Yeah, I'm conscious of time. So uh, what I'll do, I'll give a very quick overview of kind of what life was like uh, before COVID. What were some of the challenges we had um, when you know, we became fully remote working? Um, and then uh, uh, you know, it might be interesting to hear a bit from Carl, who you know, joined a few months ago to, to hear his thoughts on um, you know, how, how life was at that time, what it's like to join a, a team completely remotely, because I don't think you know, beyond our first interview, Carl, we've not, <laughs> you know, we've not really been in the same room together. Um, anyhow, life. Life before COVID, you know, we're very much office based, five days a week. We're spread across two locations, one in London, one in Newbury. Um, as a result, we were used to video conferencing a lot of the time. We, uh, as engineering teams, worked within our program increment. Uh, teams would have their own spaces for collaboration. We had a fantastic uh, swing space at the top of our London, uh, London location where we could host 100 plus people. We would utilize that to um, have hackathons on a regular basis. Those would be kind of two day, two day hackathons, which are fantastic to showcase the creativity uh, from our engineers. Um, we used it to do demo days as well, where teams mid PI could kind of present and show off and be really proud of everything that they had achieved up until that point. Um, and you know, one other thing that I particularly remember was it was just impossible to book meeting rooms. <laughs> they were like gold dust. So what happened when COVID hit? Well, from, I guess, from a service and a customer perspective, actually traffic increased to our digital estate by about 20%. And because all of our actual physical shops were closed, digital was in demand more than ever, not just from a, from a customer perspective, but also from a business perspective. Um, in March, April, we picked an amazing time to pick out, uh, to, to switch out our core supplier. So it just so happened that we were trying to onboard about 120 people when COVID hit. And so, we obviously had to completely change our plans on how we were going to onboard them. Um, what we did, we held a number of centralized boot camps. We recorded all of these videos as well um, so that any new people that weren't part of the original core could just rewatch the videos. Um, we uh, then had individual team onboarding. Uh, we had lots of knowledge transfer sessions. A lot of the teams held you know, their own regular coffee catch-ups uh, to ensure that they got to know their new uh, colleagues really, really well. Uh, we had shadowing sessions, a lot, of, uh, uh, a lot of pair programming. And I think most importantly, yeah, we, we plan for a reduction in our capacity output to actually accommodate this as well. Um, uh, so April comes, we're all working remotely. What are some of the things that Vodafone UK have done to actually mitigate uh, against the challenging circumstances that we were pre presented with? So I think 
I personally think that we handled it, well, Vodafone handled it really, really well. There's lots of hypercare to our staff, just like, you know, if we were good to go with a big release, we'd have lots of hypercare there. Actually, with this huge change in circumstances, we gave a lot of hypercare to our staff um, and we were just really, really passionate about making it work for every single person, no matter what their circumstances. And everybody, we recognize that absolutely everybody had different challenges, whether, you know, you're living by yourself or whether you've got a household full of kids that can't go to school. Um, we sent out lots of surveys, probably too many surveys, uh, but you know, they gave people a way to, um, to really communicate and, and show how they were feeling without necessarily um, you know, having to do it in front of a line manager, gave them the comfort to do that. Um, we gave everybody equipment to work from home pretty much straight away. Um, I think in some way we probably overcompensated with our communications and with the number of meetings that we had, we overcompensated for not being in the same physical space together. What that led to was pretty much back to back meetings, 8.30 till 5.30 every day for a lot of people. And you know, one of the things we found was that people weren't even getting the time to check emails or check messages. You were literally in meetings back to back. Um, so some of the things we've done then, and this, you know, some of these initiatives have been driven, driven across the entire IT, uh, IT um, estate. So we have now have protection of all of our lunch hours. There is literally a calendar block in everybody's diaries from 12 to one. Um, and we also have internally within digital engineering set Thursday afternoons out as meeting free afternoons so that uh, people can actually you know, put their heads down, crack on with some of their sprint work. Um, uh, so as I mentioned, Carl, you, know, you, you joined kind of during that height. Is there anything further that you kind of add or are there any uh, additional insights? Yeah, I, I don't know. It's, it was interesting. I remember, I think it was about the third day of working from home that I was made the offer for the role and looking ahead I'm submit like fairly apprehensive of what it means to be taken on a, a reasonably sized team starting as remote because all my experience so far had been working working from an office-based location I, I was used to sitting with my teams interacting day-to-day -day on a team with a team if you've got something that you want to discuss you just say hey should we go and grab a coffee and we'll go and sit in like one of the breakout areas and, and have a chat and all those things just suddenly disappeared when you were working through lockdown. And so for me, joining the team, some of the key aspects were um, the way that we were working and, and just how, I think, how cooperative and, and supportive the whole management team are. So that, that goes for Dave, obviously, as, as my line manager. It's just um, being able to spend time on a VC with someone as you're new to understand what those expectations are. So there's clear expectations on you. You know the people that you need to interact with um, and, and start building those relationships up through, through offline sort of options, through Slack, through little quick video calls just to say hi um, and then and start engaging in that way. And it was and it has been very different, but I think it, it's a way that we're all getting used to. The, the number of meetings has definitely tailed off, which is great. Um, and I think making sure we've given, one of the key things was empowering the people as well, that if you get a meeting invite and it's not got a clear agenda or a goal, it's not clear to you what the outcomes of that meeting are, is then, then you don't have to accept it or feel free to challenge the, the person that's called the meeting on, on why it's needed. I think that was really good because it helps it's helped drive outcomes so a meeting can be reduced in time it can be short and you just have the people on it that are needed on it um, I think that's that's been a clear thing that the digital team have done as well to to enable us so um, out, outside of that I'm I still, I still wish that I got time to spend in the office now and then with the team. I look forward to us getting back into the office and meeting people face to face. Um, but it's working. We have the tool in, we have the capabilities, we have the processes in place that allow us to work in this way. Um, and and I'm seeing that through, I mean, through PI planning. I as um, 
in safe in PI planning, the whole teams come together. And I was an observer of that being in the office in Newbury. I shared the same building when I was in the big data team as a digital team. And I would see, see those events and see the coordination and the team have done a fantastic job, for example, transferring that to, to be virtual. Um, and that's because we have the tooling and support in place to be able to achieve it. So uh, we kind of, we've run out of time, um, but what I'm going to do is I will take all the questions from the chat and from the Q&A. David and, and Carl, I hope you're okay doing this. I'll send you across some of the questions. If we can get them answered, I'll make sure that they go out to, to everyone. Um, as a final point, um, hopefully some people on the call today have been inspired to hear a little bit more about what's going on at Vodafone from a, a live perspective and from a career perspective. If you want to reach out to anyone, reach through to the career site, but I know that uh, the plan is from Vodafone's side to reach out to all the attendees just to see if they've got any other questions afterwards. So let me just unshare my screen. I will make sure that I grab all these questions as well. Well, I've tried to start answering a few. Oh, have you? Oh, perfect. <laughs> okay. So we will uh, we'll coordinate afterwards and we will make sure that uh, all these are answered. One second. Cool. cool. Fine. Amazing. Well, thank you so much for all your time. Thank you for all the attendees. And, um, and we'll get some of those answers across um, over the next few days. Great. Thanks. Yeah, thanks to everyone for, for attending. And uh, yeah, thanks, Darren, for setting up a, a great morning for us. All right. Take care, guys. Bye bye.